can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well this is my first shot at Nietzsche, so and then, so I beg your indulgence. <clears throat> Consider to, to begin with six claims. First, there's no persisting in unitary self. Second, there's no fundamental or real distinction between objects on the one hand and their properties on the other. Third, there's no fundamental or real distinction between the basic or basal properties of things and power properties of things. Fourth, no fundamental real distinction between objects or substances on the one hand and processes and events <coughs> on the other. Fifth, reality isn't truly divisible into causes and effects. Six, objects aren't governed by laws of nature ontologically distinct from them. Well, I think these claims are central to metaf Nietzsche's metaphysics. He also holds seven, that there's no free will, as ordinarily understood, although I won't say much about this. And eight, that nothing can ever happen otherwise than it does. And that's a position which is often called determinism. Um, although the name isn't apt in Nietzsche's case. Finally, for the moment, it seems to me that he inclines towards the ancient but also very modern view that there's a fundamental, non-trivial sense in which reality is one, and towards what seems to me to be the most plausible, although difficult, view of the nature of reality. That is, the, hard, the really hard-nosed monist view, which is the Spinozan, Hegelian, Racilian, Eddingtonian and Whiteheadian view that, this is number 10 on my list, reality is suffused with, <coughs> even if it doesn't consist of, mentality in some form or sense. And it seems correct to attribute 10 to him, if only because he famously holds 11, that everything is will to power. Because to say this is already to endorse 10 in some form, uh, to say that everything is in some respect mental, i.e. not just a matter of craft, that is, force considered in, or conceived of in some wholly non-mental way. So here I think we have the core of Nietzsche's metaphysics. And I'm going to put aside 11. Uh, I mean, Leiter, for example, points out that Nietzsche doesn't even mention 11 when he surveys his own work in Ikihoma. Of 1 to 10, I think the first seven negative claims are certainly true, and that the final three positive claims are very probably true. Um, Nietzsche is known as a perspectivist who's skeptical about the notion of truth, a word which he likes to put in inverted commas, <coughs> and about the whole project of metaphysics, and he has a rich variety of valid purposes in expressing himself in this way, but it's not seriously in doubt that he is in his mature thought prepared to assert all of one to eight at least. He doesn't think his views on these matters are only true in inverted commas, or true only from the perspective of some drive or some cluster of drives, or not really about what he calls, I quote, the true being of things, the in themselves of things. And I'm happy to leave the detailed defense of this last claim to others, John Richardson for one. In this talk, I want to focus on two to six. Nietzsche's endorsement of one, the view that there's no persisting unitary self, I think needs no argument, and it's deeply bound up with his endorsement of two to five. Nor does his seventh, his denial of free will, need argument. Eight is pretty, in fact, pretty tangled up with three to six, so I will talk about it a bit. Um, but, but I won't talk about it centrally, except to make one point now, which is that the reason the name determinism is inappropriate in Nietzsche's case is that although he makes free use of the notions of power and force, he purges the, the thesis that nothing can ever happen otherwise than it does of the notion of compulsion, the notion of necessity understood as some kind of compulsion. He treats it rather, and, and in my view most deeply, as a, as a kind of tautology, in a way that we can perhaps picture first by thinking of Leibniz's causeless universe, in which every true statement about anything is an analytic truth, and then perhaps, again indirectly, of the four-dimensionalist block universe of relativity theory. What about nine? I'm just going through these, some, saying a few things about these before getting on to the main issue. The view that, in some sense, all is one. Well, I don't want to insist on this, and will say only that Nietzsche's criticisms of the Thomistic or cutting tendencies and the matching atomistic tendencies of human thought and language tend in this direction. Thinking, he says, takes apart what is really one, and this is one of his most constant themes. It's le less clear, perhaps, and a subject for another time, that he's a, an all-out 
monist, and I, I mean a thing monist, not a stuff monist by this. Um, so in line with Parmenides, Spinoza, many Indian philosophers, and many modern physicists and cosmologists who hold that there is in the final analysis only one thing, that's space-time, which is itself an object, a concrete individual. Uh, well, Nietzsche's views have a fine ancestry. They are, in a sense, traditional. And they're strongly in accord, as I've already said, with much in present-day physics. Their main elements are found in Heraclitus, in the Buddha, in some of the work of the Buddha's near-contemporary Plato. In early modern times, they connect strongly with Spinoza and Leibniz, at least, and more recently with Whitehead and the later Russell, among others. Many more connections can be made, some of which I'll indicate. But I'm not particularly concerned with questions of influence. There are fundamental points on which Nietzsche agrees with Descartes, uh, and this is a point he pleases me to stress, um, because Descartes is a great genius, misunderstood. And also points on which he agrees with Locke and Hume and Kant and Schopenhauer. And none of this is surprising. Truth tends to occur independently to different thinkers and to force its way out. Uh, Met I'm quoting William James, who says that metaphysics means nothing but an unusually obstinate effort to think clearly. And no one is more obstinate than Nietzsche. It seems to me, in fact, that he has this completely uncanny nose for truth, which seems to extend beyond the psychological to the, to the physical, and it's almost bewildering to me. Um, and some of this, I think, came up earlier in the, the, the parallel session that I attended, where um, connections were made between Nietzsche's thought and present-day physics. But not all of you were here. Anyway, my present aim is to give a brief exposition of part of what I take to be the right view about the fundamental nature of reality, with some special reference to Nietzsche. So I'd be amazed and worried if there were anything new in what I have to say about Nietzsche. I simply want to provide a certain view of reality with one distinguished reference point among others. And I'm going to use the late notebooks freely, even when there are equally good quotations from the work Nietzsche published himself. So I also see this paper as containing slots for supporting quotations to be supplied by others. So perhaps the first thing to do, reality as it, as it is in itself, I'll hold my hand up. Perhaps the first thing to do when it comes to the discussion of Nietzsche's metaphysics, and it should be unnecessary, but philosophy is, of course, a cesspit of misunderstanding. <laughs> One of the things, the first things to do is to note that Nietzsche isn't sceptical about the notion of reality as it is in itself. This is hardly surprising because such scepticism is incoherent. It's incoherent because, on the handout one, to be is necessarily to be a certain way at any given time, to be somehow or other, and two, the way that being is at any given time just is the way it is in itself. And if you don't like the reality of time, you can just drop the words at any given time. Someone might say that the point fails in Nietzsche's case because he holds that being is becoming. But obviously that's no good. Reality is a certain way as it is in itself, whatever the nature of reality is. So if reality is becoming, and I have no objection to this terminology, although I'm going to avoid it for the most part because of it has ancient and tangled roots. Um, so if reality is becoming, then that's the way reality is in itself, and there is, of course, a certain way of becoming, i.e. reality is it, as it is in itself. I'm going to skip a few points, um, objections based on the misunderstanding of quantum mechanics here. Um, another possible objection is that Nietzsche writes that, there, I quote, there is no truth, and, and I quote again, what can be thought of must surely be a fiction. The first point to make in reply to that, of course, is that there's no tension between holding that there's a determinate truth about how things are in themselves and skepticism about our ability to know what it is. Second, it's true that Nietzsche constantly stresses the point that ordinary human thought or language is profoundly inadequate when it comes to the attempt to try to express the nature of reality. Human thought and language is in part essentially constituted by falsifying structures, fictionalizations of, or errors about that reality. Still, Nietzsche never for a moment thinks that there's any insuperable difficulty in using language that builds in such errors to express truths about those very errors, or indeed truths of other kinds. So we have to weigh remarks which seem to express global skepticism about the possibility of expressing the truth, 
about anything against the vast mass of the rest of his work, which is everywhere premised on the assumption that it is possible to express the truth about how things are or aren't. After all, the vast body of his work consists almost entirely of truth claims of this sort. Uh, I guess maybe this is a dead issue. That's what I've been picking up from some of the papers I've heard recently. Um, but it used not to be. Um, it's not as if it's hard to fit these highly general, dubitative remarks by Nietzsche into his work considered as a whole. It's, it's easy. It's easy to understand their point in the context of his other views. It's no harder than understanding the intuitively natural Buddhist distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth. Uh, I really do think that a horrible amount of time has been wasted here. Um, as Kant said, I'm quoting, many historians of philosophy, with all their intended praise, attribute mere nonsense to part philosophers, past philosophers. They're incapable of recognizing beyond what the philosophers actually said, what they really meant to say. And again, if we take single passages torn from their context and compare them with one another, Contradictions are not likely to be lacking, especially in a work that is written with any freedom of expression. But they are, Kant says, easily resolved by those who have mastered the idea of the whole. So, maybe this is just banal now. I mean, what Nietzsche's no truth, no knowledge, no metaphysics remarks do is teach us something about how to read him, both in his published works and in his notebooks. Take a simple example, when Nietzsche proposes that reality is best thought of as a continuum or unified process whose nature thought, human thought and language inevitably falsify by cutting it up, both spatially and temporally, into distinct objects or individual causes and effects, he's claiming that this is how things actually are. So if saying this sort of thing involves chancing your arm on a question of fact, then Nietzsche is certainly chancing his arm. And whether or not that's so, he certainly doesn't think that words like continuum are condemned by belonging to human thought and language to being ultimately inapplicable to reality. I, I would qualify some of those remarks about continuum in the light of the, again, parallel session I just attended, which talked quite a lot about Nietzsche's commitment to some kind of um, quantal view of reality. I don't think it's necessary to do that now. Okay. Now, what about that question, in fact, I just mentioned, which concerns four on my list of theses? Well, very roughly, physics, I take it, has sufficiently shown that all objects are processes, that they're equally well thought of as processes. We've learned that matter is astonishingly ethereal, that substance is almost inconceivably insubstantial relative to our everyday conception of it. Grainy individual particles were already being treated um, as insubstantial as mathematical points, and hence mere theoretical posits in the 18th century, as something Nietzsche was aware of, in fact. And they lost all particular punctuality long ago, as they gave way to fields in post-1925 quantum physics, um, leaving out all the popular phenomena of entanglement. Everyday objects from stones to brains are collocations of patterns of energy, diaphanous process entities, whose existence evolves a constant interchange with the quantum vacuum, given which it's literally correct to say that they're partly constituted by the quantum vacuum. So the idea that processes or events require some sort of substance that is in some way distinct from them, and in which they can go on or occur, has really long collapsed. The whole object, process, property, state, event, conceptual cluster of concepts is indeed hopelessly superficial. And nor did we need modern physics to, to see this any more than the ancient Indian and Greek philosophers did. Some of the distinctions in the object, process, property, and state event cluster seem to us to mark real, irreducible, metaphysically fundamental differences. They seem integral to our most basic discursive subject predicate forms of thought. And we can allow that they're very natural, practically indispensable, in everyday life, but they are profoundly misleading <coughs> when taken up in metaphysics as a guide to the fundamental nature of reality, as Nietzsche fundamental, uh, constantly stresses. And it isn't actually particularly hard to see that this is so. All reality is process, as Whitehead was moved to observe by his study of 20th century physics, 
and, as Heraclitus remarked long ago, Nietzsche's beings are becoming, as Richardson says, and so are ours. Matter is best thought of as process stuff. Matter is essentially dynamic, essentially temporal, essentially changeful. Objects or matter can't be conceptualized as things whose existence can be grasped separately from their temporality. To quote Nietzsche, another familiar quotation, the separation of doing from the doer, of what happens from a something that makes it happen, a process from something that's not processed, but is enduring, substance, thing, body, soul, etc. The attempt to grasp what happens is a kind of displacement and repositioning of what is, of what persists, that ancient mythology set down the belief in cause and effect, <clears throat> once this belief had found a fixed form in the grammatical functions of language. Well, I sometimes think that we should always call matter time matter, or matter in time, so that we never for a moment forget its essential temporality and essential changefulness. When you grasp matter as time matter, there's no more given in its being at a time than it is through time. Indeed, is not given in its true being at all, insofar as it's considered at a time, but only when it's considered through time, except that the word through is already wrong, because it carries the false picture of matter as somehow travelling through time, which is false, because matter's time being is part of its being in such a way that it can't really be said to exist through time at all. When you see all this, then you see that to assert, it, assert thesis 8, that nothing can happen other than it does, is just to say that matter, that's time matter, is what it is. To say that, even to say that matter does certain things, or behaves in a certain way, is already to have falsified the reality of matter, in suggests, insofar as it suggests that its behavior could be distinguished from its nature. So, um, so far we have the negative version of 4 in place, um, and I'm now going to the positive form of 4. It's simple, of course, it's just all objects are processes, which I've already said, so that's the first plank. Um, all the things we naturally pick out as objects are just as well, and actually with no great difficulty, thought of as processes in fundamental metaphysics, given that we allow ourselves to go on talking of objects at all in philosophy. You ought perhaps to consider very seriously whether to go on talking of objects at all, but it's undoubtedly convenient for many purposes, as Nietzsche realized, and it isn't in fact that hard to suspend or suppress the potentially misleading implications of such talk. So here's, that was just one familiar and I think relatively clear sample of Nietzsche's metaphysical thinking. And one simple way to frame his general metaphysical approaches is as a rejection of two doctrines we can call separatism and staticism. Next thing on my handout. Um, one can state and criticize these doctrines, again making the point clearly, using the language of objects and property. Again, it's not as if the statement and criticism are undermined by the fact that the language of object and property in its ordinary use has the doctrines built into it. So, separatism separates objects sharply from objects. Against thesis 5 and 9. Uh, and also against 1. So too, separatism separates an object from its propertiness against thesis 2. That's a crucial doctrine which I'm going to discuss in some detail. Uh, it's, separatism combines with staticism in separating matter from force against 6, thesis 6. Put otherwise in the explicit terms of 6, it separates things from laws of nature, and then says, separatistically, that the latter govern the former. Separatism and staticism combine again against thesis 4, as remarked in the last section, to separate basic existence from time or temporality, or in more Nietzschean terms, being from becoming, in a way profoundly contrary to modern physics. Well, I've distinguished 10 slash 11 claims for purposes of philosophical discussion, but this separation too is, of course, artificial. There are many internal connections and redundancies among the claims. So, for example, thesis 3 can be seen as dropping out of 2 and 6. And I'm delaying direct discussion of 5, that is, Nietzsche's views on causation, but 4, 5, and 6, in fact, all of 2 to 6, go very closely together. <coughs> 
What should we oppose to staticism? Well, dynamicism, process metaphysics, Heraclitianism, the names don't matter. To separatism, well, monism, holism, metaphysical relationalism, the Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination, maybe in Naga, Nagarjuna's formulation of the emptiness doctrine. Well, there are lots of names you can have. I favor the name identity metaphysics. Now, the name may be thought to express only the rejection of separatism and not also staticism. But this too is superficial. It depends on another false separation, the separation of separatism from staticism. A separation which is very useful for analytical purposes, but which is, to repeat, metaphysically superficial. More particularly, it depends on the idea that there's a sharp distinction between space and time. And that idea is radically and extraordinarily false, given what we know of the nature of space-time. We now speak freely of space-time using the single word to mark the collapse of the idea that space and time are radically distinct from each other. But we might do well to add the word matter into that word, to get the single word space-time matter. Um, uh, the Nobel Prize winner Stephen Weinberg suggests that, that all the objects we take ourselves to have to, we have to do with in life are best conceived of as like space-time being itself a physical object, the only one there is, an essentially substantial something. That apart, or however you, that may be, where ordinary thought and vast tracts of metaphysics find distinctness, discreteness, numerical difference, Identity metaphysics finds unity, continuity, identity. Identity metaphysics, after all, is identitates philosophie. Spinoza is one of its exemplary practitioners, followed by Schelling, the inventor of the term, and Hegel. Nietzsche's thought lies in the same tradition. It lies there because it's true, not because it's a tradition. And although he also lays a great stress on differences of force or power or rank. Well, separatism and staticism lie very deep in language with its basal subject predicate form, but we can see easily enough that this is so, and we can say so in language and find ways of putting things that avoid the problem. We have in language words like process, flow, and flux that allow us to say what is wrong with conceptions of the nature of reality which find some sharp separations, discrete existences where really there are none. We can say with Heraclitus, in whose proximity, Nietzsche writes, I quote, he feels warmer and better than anywhere else that everything flows. Okay, now consider two, the seemingly radical claim that there's no fundamental distinction between, to be made between objects on the one hand and their properties on the other. Well, I say the claim is radical, and it may indeed be un-Aristotelian, but it's hardly radical if by radical we mean radically unorthodox. Um, it seems to be relatively little known, but Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and Kant are among those who unite with Nietzsche in their endorsement of two. They all hold, to use and slightly extend Descartes' terms, that there is no real distinction, only a conceptual distinction, between an object considered at any given time and its properties, its attributes and modes. Well, there's no real distinction between two things A and B on Descartes' terms, when they can't possibly exist apart. The clearest case in which A and B can't possibly exist apart, and it is in the end, perhaps, the only case, um, is the case in which A and B are identical. But then there's only one thing, and nothing can exist apart from itself. Strikingly, for some it's striking, the case of an object <coughs> at any given time and its propertiedness considered at that time is a case of this kind. So I claim. So too is true. The claim that there's no real distinction between an object and its propertiedness, because the positive version of two objects or substances are literally identical with their propertiedness. Well, at first this claim seems plainly false, given a standard training in analytic philosophy, and given the extreme naturalness of counterfactual thought, which builds in so many of the metaphysical errors Nietzsche's criticizes, but not after a while. Well, I've argued for two in another place, and here I'm just going to cite other people instead. So here's Descartes, he's concise. I quote, the attributes of a substance, when considered collectively, he says, are indeed identical with the substance. 
Nietzsche is even more concise. I quote, a thing equals its qualities. Subtract the doing, as he often says, and there's no doer left over. One might think that Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza want to hang on to a robust notion of substance in a way that Nietzsche doesn't. But there's a fundamental respect in which this isn't so, in which they're at one. The great rationalists are not less radical than Nietzsche. And actually, Locke and Hume are also fully in line, epistemologically speaking, in holding that we have absolutely no legitimate idea of substance, nor any, indeed any legitimate reason to suppose it exists, insofar as it's taken to be something that is in any way other than or more than particular qualities. So, so among the seven most well-known early modern philosophers, only Berkeley is out of line on this issue, in fact, except that the British empiricists keep it epistemological and don't go ontological. Uh, the thesis that an object is literally identical with its propertiness is indeed radical and initially difficult to think, given the structure of human thought and language, given in particular that the word property is an intrinsically relational word that asks for something for it to be a property of. But it's sufficiently understandable for all that, and it's also, mm -hmm. and again, right in line with modern physics. Does it seem hard to think? Well, actually, it's not that hard, and it's something that one can grow into deeply, and of course this is doing philosophy, or indeed physics. Descartes is, as it were, Mr. Substance for most philosophers, but the popular version of early modern philosophy bears little resemblance to the true story, which is much, much more exciting. Descartes was neither the first nor the last to think that the word substance is an empty word, a mere placeholder with no clear meaning other than existent or real. He did, though, very much want to be left in peace to get on with his work, and he really was most anxious not to annoy the church. And he used the word substance increasingly in communication with others who couldn't really think in other terms. And of course, he has all these famous comments of, to his friend Regis, or his one-time friend Regis, about how he shouldn't annoy people and um, try and talk in their language. Actually, it's also perhaps insufficiently well known that Descartes agreed with Nietzsche as I understand him, that all is one, at least insofar as the material universe is concerned. For Descartes, the universe is a single substance, one big extended thing. It just has these different sort of nubbly gradients of texture, which we think of as trains and cars and people. But really, there's only one thing. Kant is also on side, as remarked, when he says, and I quote, that in their relation to substance, accidents or properties are not really subordinated to it, but are the manner of existence of the substance itself. He gets the matter exactly right, it seems to me. Nothing more needs to be said, and as so often in philosophy, the mistake is to try to say more. Put aside philosophy and consider an object in front of you in the fullness of its reality. There's no ontological subordination of the object's properties to the object itself. There's no existential inequality or priority of any sort, no ontological dependence of either on the other, no independence of either from the other. There is, in other words, no real problem of universals and particulars, as traditionally understood, only a number of philosophically habitual ways of understanding the terms object and property that just can't survive a proper appreciation of the present point. Um, the realisation that this can, can be, is so can be uncomfortable if one's been habituated to the philosophical debate, but it settles out and matures powerfully in time. One looks at any ordinary object, and it's deeply mysterious how there can be thought to be a problem. It's, it's so sein, its being the way it is, is identical to its sign, its being. Well, what happens, of course, now is that objections based on counterfactuals flood to the front of many philosophers' minds. And I'll say something about this soon. For the moment, note that we can, as David Armstrong says, and I'm quoting again, it's on the handout, distinguish the particularity of a particular from its properties. But, he says, the two factors are too intimately together to speak of a relation between them. The thisness and the nature are incapable of existing apart from each other. Bare particulars are vicious abstractions from what may be called states of affairs this of a certain nature. Well, this seems to me to be entirely Cartesian and Spinozan and Leibnizian and Kantian and Nietzschean. We can, as Armstrong 
says, I distinguish the particularity of a particular from its properties, we can make this conceptual distinction, but we can't really speak of a relation, a real distinction between them. Two is true. Objects are literally identical with their propertiedness. This is entirely compatible with claiming that an object's properties, including its intrinsic or non-relational properties, may and do change through time while it remains the same object. Well, no, it, I, no, it isn't, someone says, and I've got, I've got this almost verbatim on the handout because I thought it's a bit more complicated. If someone says to me, look, to hold that objects are identical with their properties is to hold, this is Roman 1, that objects necessarily have all the properties they have. But, we the objector says, we naturally say that object X, for example, would still have been the object it is at time t, even if its properties or propertiedness P had been different to T. We naturally say it would still be the object it is, even if some at least of its properties were other than they are in fact. To which I reply, true. But nothing here forbids this way of talking about the non-actual. The fact that there are contexts in which we find it natural to say, this is Roman 2, that X's properties might have been different from what they are while it remained the same object doesn't provide any support at all for the mistaken idea that Roman 3, an object has or must have some form or mode of being independent of its having the properties it does have. To think that it does is to build a whole metaphysics of object and property into counterfactual thought, a metaphysics that it doesn't contain or license as it stands, and that's simply incorrect in the present view. We can perfectly well say Roman 4 X might not have had the properties it does now have, say if we're supposing that determinism is false. Because this doesn't put two in question. It doesn't challenge the view that whatever happens, everything in which the being of X consists at any time is identical to everything in which the being of X's propertiedness consists at that time. It's possible to read Arabic Thesis 2 in such a way that it's challenged by Roman 4, but if one does, one simply misses, chooses to ignore the fundamental metaphysical truth expressed by two. Uh, I can't really go on about this more, but you really need to... Some people think, well, I'm just reiterating the old bundle theory about objects are just collections of properties, but the trouble with that, as it's usually stated, is the word property... The meaning of property has already had to have been transformed in your thought. Um, and if the old the old bundle theory is usually presented is still making use of the, a notion of property that makes it seem grotesquely implausible thing to say. That's because the error is built into the word property. So it takes a bit of time. Um, another objection. Someone says, I'm bald, but my propertiedness is not bald, therefore I'm not identical to my propertiedness. This is meant to be not without an argument that Leibniz is law. But the reply to that is this um, this is language, not metaphysics. And I, I think I can answer that with Nietzsche. It's childish to think that this, such an appeal to Leibniz's law can refute identity metaphysics in this way. To understand the present claim, to accept the sense in which the being of X is identical with the being of its propertiedness, and that there is such a sense isn't in question, is to see that this style of objection has no force. It simply bounces off its target. It depends on what's been discarded the standard language-enshrined object-property distinction that drives the interminable debate about particulars and universals. So I don't think Frank Ramsey exaggerates when he says, and I quote, the whole theory of universals is due to mistaking a characteristic of language for a fundamental characteristic of reality. And Whitehead only exaggerates a little, perhaps, when he says, and I quote, that all modern philosophy hinges round the difficulty of describing the world in terms of subject and predicate, substance and quality, particular and universal. And both of them, of course, agree with Nietzsche, whose entry I have delayed in, until now. That's just, as it were, an artifact of the fact that I ha had all these stuff down, and then I discovered that Nietzsche could be recruited to the cause. So he comes... <laughs> Language is built in terms of the most naive prejudices. We read disharmonies and problems into things because we think only in the form of language, thus believing in the eternal truth of reason, e.g. subject, predicate, etc. Because he comes first in the, in the historical order now. <clears throat> Nietzsche often focuses on causation when making this point. I'm 
let me quote, he's that we have a right to distinguish between subject and predicate, he says, that is our strongest belief. In fact, at bottom, even the belief in cause and effect itself, in conditio and conditionatum, is merely an individual case of the first and general belief, our primeval belief in subject and predicate. Might not this belief in the concept of subject and predicate be a great stupidity? Um, and claims two and four are in fact deeply connected to claims three, five, and six, which are in turn thickly interwoven with each other. And it's to this triplet that I now turn. Um, subject predicate, the connection of subject and predicate with cause and effect is, as it were, mediating the transition. Uh, well, the first point is a quick one. I, it seems to me clear that Nietzsche's animadversions versions against talk of causes and effects don't amount to any sort of scepticism about the reality of what we can perfectly well call causal process. Nor do they amount to any qualification of his view that nothing can ever happen otherwise than it does. His belief, this, this may cause dissent, his belief in what we can well call natural necessity. So long as we detach this term from any idea that anything in nature is bossing anything else about or compelling it. What nature is objecting to in the classic Buddhist style is the substantivalist separatism of talk about individual causes and effects. He's asserting five, the claim that reality is not truly divisible into causes and effects. Here's a quotation from the Gay Science. A concept of cause and effect have merely perfected the image of becoming without reason reaching above the image or behind it. Cause and effect, there is probably never such a duality. In truth, a continuum confronts us, out of which we isolate a couple of pieces. Okay. Um, the error of dividing the reality continuum, the becoming reality, into discrete substantival causes and effects is for Nietzsche a particularly salient case of the fundamental error built into the fundamental form of discursive thought. That is, most centrally, the subject predicate form or noun verb form, which inevitably enacts the object property error and or the being becoming error. Well, against this error so far, we already have in place the positive versions of thesis two and four. Objects are processes, there's no real distinction between objects and their propertiveness. The next thing to bring into the line is the positive version of three. As it stands, three in its negative form states that there's no fundamental real distinction, only at best a conceptual distinction, between a thing X's basal properties and its power properties. Put otherwise, and here I'm, going to in, I'm intentionally introducing an extremely unhelpful terminology because it's so widespread that it's worth trying to express the correct view in its terms, although they resist the truth. So put in these other terms, th negative three states that there's no fundamental real distinction, only at best a conceptual distinction between X's categorical properties and X's dispositional properties. Now, to consider three in any form, is again to separate out for purposes of discussion an aspect of what is, in the end, a single thesis, the single thesis of identity metaphysics, which inevitably comes out as something complex in human thought and language. So the separation is again artificial. But one has, of course, one has to do this sort of thing when doing human philosophy. And one can perfectly well, when using language, and one can perfectly well do it in the service of trying to show, as I am now trying to show, how and why the separations are artificial. So I'm not only going to talk for the moment in terms of the categorical disposition of distinction, I'm also going to continue to talk in terms of objects and properties. The separatist object property idiom can be dispensed with, and I'll regularly also talk simply and neutrally of being, in a way that doesn't divide reality into objects and properties. And by being I just mean becoming, I'm not, in, I'm not invoking that distinction. But I have a special dialectical purpose in retaining the language of object and property. I'm not retaining it because the relevant points flow more easily or look more plausible when put in these terms, but for the opposite reason, because they look less plausible or more vulnerable when put in these terms. So the idea is that when one thinks the points through in the more resistant object property terms, one can see that the points hold even when these terms are adhered to. 
So that's meant to give extra force to the, to the attempted demonstration. So this is the last hard bit <clears throat> to begin. It's generally agreed that to talk about ob object X's dispositions or dispositional properties in context like the present one is to talk of its powers or power properties, which actually we may perfectly well call its causal properties. It's less clear, much less clear to me at least, what the term categorical is standardly used to mean in this context. But the simplest or minimal way to understand it, I think, is as denoting X's basic or fundamental or intrinsic or primary qualities or properties, whatever they are. So X's categorical being, I propose, is the totality of X's actual, concretely existing being, whatever is nature. Now, plainly, this definition of categorical doesn't exclude, doesn't exclude the possibility that a thing's dispositional properties should turn out to be among its categorical properties, categorical properties and nor should it. Well, so far, so perhaps so good. The next thing to record, this is it's commonly held, this is A, that the categorical properties of X are the ground of X's dispositional or power properties, and that the categorical properties of X are the whole ground of X's dispositional or power properties, so that the dispositional or power properties are in no way ontologically over and above the categorical properties. Well, this view is most familiarly associated with Locke in modern philosophy. And it's plainly central to it that the distinction between categorical and dispositional properties is at best a conceptual distinction. It's not any sort of irreducible ontological distinction. There's nothing more to the power properties or power being of a thing than its categorical properties or categorical being, according to Locke, who's might be right. If the thing's categorical being is in place, then its power being is in place, and conversely. A thing's power being for Locke is literally part of its actual contrary existing being. Its categorical being plainly doesn't exclude its power being given the present definition of the word categorical. Well, I think this so far is clearly the right line to take. But A and B are often combined with the view of C that the categorical properties of X are in some way ontologically over and above the dispositional or power properties of X. And while C may seem natural enough at first, it is what's at issue here, because this, to accept three, as, as Nietzsche does and as I do, is to deny C. That is, is to deny that there is, any, there is or can be anything more to a thing's being than its power being. Uh, I agree with Nietzsche that C is a great mistake, um, however natural it may seem at first. In fact, I think the point is, effectively a priori, once one accepts the reality of power being at all, as any serious philosopher must. So let me try to, ex to explain. Well, this will obviously, you know, the wanted conclusion here is that all power be all being is power being, which I take to be a Nietzschean thesis. So, most philosophers agree that there can no more be dispositional being without categorical being than there can be categorical being without dispositional being. They accept that everything has both categorical being and dispositional being, most. Some do reject the first half of this claim, holding that there's no categorical being, only dispositional being. And I've got that down as D. I've got too many letters and numbers, really, but D. This is D. There is only dispositional being. Well, I'm going to consider this horribly ill-expressed suggestion later. For that, though, consider the following strengthened version of the claim that everything has both categorical and dispositional being. This is CD1 and CD2. Nothing can possibly have the total categorical being it has and not have the total dispositional or power being that it has. And conversely, nothing can possibly have the total dispositional being if it has and not have the total categorical being that it has. I think this is just obvious on reflection, given that we agree to use the dreaded categorical dispositional language at all. But before I argue for this, note that it's a very short step, if it's a step at all, from that conjunction of those two theses, which I'll just call CD, to the seemingly stronger claim we've already encountered, that is, the categorical dispositional formulation of three. That is, there's no real distinction, only a conceptual distinction between an object's categorical properties or being and its dispositional properties or being. And a small step from there to my preferred candidate for 
positive form of three, which is the seemingly stronger claim that a thing's categorical properties or being and its dispositional properties of being are, reality, are really or in reality identical, which can be put more simply as three again, a thing's X's basal being or propertiness <coughs> is identical with its power being or propertiness, which comes down in, in effect and in the end to all being is power of being. I say seemingly stronger because I don't think that three, the positive identity claim, is really stronger than the negative, no real distinction claim. Um, well, look, all this may seem quite wrong, and I know it does seem quite wrong to um, a very large number of present-day so-called analytic metaphysicians. Routine thoughts about the multiple realizability of certain functional properties, which of course are dispositional properties, prompts the following familiar linked objections to what I call CD. Someone's going to say, look, two things can be dispositionally or power identical without being categorically identical, and also a thing can be changed in respect of its categorical properties without being changed in respect of its dispositional or power properties. So two thoughts about possible worlds may prompt the idea of three, a thing can be changed in respect of its dispositional or power properties without being changed in respect of its categorical properties. And the accompanying O4, two things can be categorically identical without being dispositionally or power identical. In fact, though, none of these things can be so. Nothing like asserting, asserting things. Take up, let me give an argument, take O3 o and O4 first. Huge numbers of recent philosophical thought experiments depend on O3 and O4. They build in the profoundly separatist assumption that a material thing, say X, can be thought of as retaining its intrinsic nature or basic categorical being unchanged across different economic environments while changing its dispositional being on account of its different economic environment. But this idea is incoherent on Nietzsche's view as it is on mine. This is just thesis six, in fact. As it is, indeed, it seems to me, on any view that takes seriously the present-day physics point that mass or matter is just a form of energy. Matter isn't a passively sitting stuff that is then, as it were, then is a sort of quasi-temporal term. A passively sitting stuff that is then regimented by laws. Laws of nature can't be supposed to be in any way ontologically independent of rather than essentially constitutive of part of the categorical or intrinsic nature of matter or energy. A matter or reality is force or energy. Regularity, now I'm quoting Nietzsche, that is the unalterable sequence of certain phenomena does not prove a law but a power relation between two or several forces. To say this is him imagining and someone speaking, uh, to say, but precisely this relation remains the same, means nothing more than one and the same force cannot be a different force as well. I think this takes a little thinking about it first, but it's, that it's exactly right. Here Nietzsche imagines someone thinking that the claim, but precisely this relation remains the same, requires or involves appeal to the law as an explanation of its truth. But that's to misunderstand what a force is, what reality is. When you understand that, you see that, but precisely this relation remains the same. It's really nothing more than a tautology or necessary truth. A particular instance of the necessary truth that everything is what it is and not another thing. In Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche writes, I quote, that in the in itself, there is nothing of causal connections of necessity, there the effect does not follow the cause, there is no law. And again, this is exactly right, properly understood. There are no laws of nature, no objective laws of working, necessitating anything, in addition to the matter or stuff of reality. The point acquires a special vividness given a four-dimensionalist or block universe view of things, insofar as this gives us a picture of reality laid out as a whole, as it were, already containing all the phenomena that lead us to talk of cause and necessity and laws in a way 
that the four-dimensionalist picture shows up as superficial relative to the great givenness of the four-dimensional reality. So it does look very vivid in that if you're a four-dimensionalist, but um, the point holds just as well with the more conventional view of the flowing nature of time. Um, so much for 03 and 04. Turning back now to 01 and 02, that's the objection, uh, which is in effect an objection to three, the claim of all being is power being. The objection that's based on the fact that certain properties may be said to be multiply realizable. But it, this, this objection doesn't deserve serious consideration because obviously two differently constructed pocket calculators can be functionally or dispositionally identical in some respect, that is, mathematically speaking, say, they can do the same things. Equally, obviously, their total dispositional being will be different if they're differently constructed. So they will melt differently or float differently or smell differently. It is, in the end, a trivial point that if they are in any way categorically different, they will necessarily be dispositionally different. I mean, suppose you've got two calculators off the same production line. One atom's difference between them makes a difference between their total dispositions. And so too, no less trivially, if you change the categorical being of one of them in any way, you AO ipso change its total dispositional being. So I hope perhaps no one will disagree with this. So let me now turn, nearly finally, to D, the claim that there's only dispositional being, because some have thought that this is Nietzsche's own view. Well, um, the trouble lies in the word dispositional, once again, and in the use of the categorical dispositional opposition. We really should have stuck to talking of power properties or powers, with Locke and the great historical majority, keeping clear on the point that power properties are, of course, actual properties, substantive realities. And this gets, this turns P, this turns D, all, all being as dispositional being, uh, which into P, all being as power being, which of course is three again, as well as a version of six, because they are all massively interlocked, these theses. P is better, the claim that all being is power being, obviously because it has no sort of reductive air of the kind that clings so weirdly to D. Um, and drives D, in fact, in incoherence. Um, in effect, and again, P amounts to the claim that all being is energy, forms of energy. And I take this to be orthodoxy in physics. D, by contrast, is really extraordinarily confusing and soon leads to such peculiar claims as the claim that reality is just a matter of bearerless dispositions. We can say that this is just, this is just bad language, if we like, but it is very, very bad language and has caused horrible confusion. If we continue to take it that dispositional property and power property are equivalent, and that the categorical and dispositional are strongly opposed terms, then categorical property must presumably mean non-power property. And this has actually recently come up, and this has now been adopted as a definition in some of the recent literature on this, e.g. by Alexander Bird. Uh, but then we have the picture of things with non-power properties and power properties. Sorry, we have a picture of things with non-power properties and then power properties that they have wholly in virtue of having their non-power properties. And this really seems a truly absurd view of reality and a proper target of Occam's razor, apart from involving a truly wild degree of separatism. And yet, the con so I'm saying it's terrible, but the consequences of rejecting it, or something like it, may still seem too problematic for some. Because the consequence is nothing less than this. The consequence is that it seems that any existing property must, ipso facto, or AO ipso, be a power property. That's what the claim, why I'm saying that the it seems to be a priori, this conclusion, once you've admitted that there's such a thing as power at all. The only way to exist without being potent, without being disposed to have an effect on other things, is not to exist. <laughs> um, well, obviously, say Leibniz and Nietzsche, and I don't know who else. And I think we should react, welcome that reaction of obviousness. Um, I do think it's important to see how undramatic 
how boring, as it were, the point is in the end, although it seems so hard at first. At one point Nietzsche writes that, I quote, the absolute necessity of the same things happening in one course of the world as in all others throughout eternity, not a determinism about what happens, but merely the expression of the fact that the impossible is not possible. <coughs> that one particular force can't be anything other than precisely that particular force. And he concludes that note by saying, I quote, that what happens and what necessarily happens is a tautology. Well, that obviously doesn't make sense as it stands, and of course it is only an entry in a notebook. But I think it's clear what Nietzsche means. The two phrases, what happens and what necessarily happens, are in fact equivalent. What happens just is what necessarily happens. So the claim that what happens is what necessarily happens is effectively tautological, because it's just like saying that what happens is what, hap that what happens is what happens, which is of course an overt tautology. And the idea occurs again in another note from the same year, where he says, regularity proves only that one and the same happening is not another happening as well. Here it seems to me all Nietzsche's thoughts about being, becoming, power, law, force, will, energy, cause, necessity, and fate converge. Spinoza and Leibniz stand in the background of the past, the early modern past at least, and Einstein with his theory of relativity in the foreshadowed future. Einstein is at one with Nietzsche when he writes, I quote, a being endowed with higher insight and more perfect intelligence watching man and his doings, would smile about man's illusion that he was acting according to his own free will. Einstein writes that, having just remarked that, famously, I think, quoting Einstein, if the moon, in the act of completing its eternal way around the earth, were gifted with self-consciousness, it would feel thoroughly convinced that it was traveling its way of its own accord on the strength of a resolution taken once and for all. <laughs>